You're watching Chili Boy Productions. I'm Larry Chili Boy Chilson, and this is my ranking for all 11 films in the Wizarding World. Now, before we get into this ranking, make sure to go ahead and click that subscribe button down below so that you can chill with me on each and every one of my latest videos. Now, if you haven't been following along here, I recently reacted to each and every one of the original Harry Potter films, watching almost all of them for the first time ever. Now, I had already seen all three of the Fantastic Beasts films, and I actually saw all three of those in theaters, but I watched those without ever really having seen the Harry Potter series. But now that my journey is complete, now that I am all caught up on the wizarding world, officially considering myself a Hogwarts alumni, I thought, what a perfect time to share my ranking of all 11 films from the Wizarding World franchise. Now, I did recently do a live stream ranking all of the main characters just from the Harry Potter series, so make sure to Check that out if you want to know who my favorite characters are. Now, we are finally integrating my viewings of the Fantastic Bee series with my viewings of the Harry Potter series. And I'm giving the Chili Boy definitive ranking of all 11. Now, just remember, this is only my own personal ranking. I have a feeling it's not going to be a popular one. <laughs> also, my viewpoint is probably going to actually be quite different from most like diehard Potterheads because I didn't grow up with these films. I didn't grow up reading the books and being immersed in this world. I watched them as an adult and I watched them after having seen the prequel movie so far. So my experience with the films is going to be vastly different than most everyone else's experience out there. And I'm sure that has an effect on my rankings. But of course, I want to hear all of your rankings of the 11 Wizarding World films in the comment section down below. So whether you agree, you disagree, I want to know how you rank these films. So make sure to share it. Now, without further ado, let's kick things off. At number 11, aka last place, I have Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald is easily still my least favorite film from the franchise. Of course, there are things I enjoyed. I did love seeing like the Niffler return. I loved seeing the different beasts once again on screen. I personally like Newt and enjoyed his role here. Getting Zoe Kravitz added in was also a lot of fun. However, I hated the way they took Queenie's character, and I didn't really like how they decided to her turn her character. I was really looking for more from Grindelwald specifically uh, and his motivations. That final reveal was also messy. Really, the whole script was messy. The whole Nagini character reveal was a hot mess. Character motivations didn't make sense. Plot points didn't actually make a whole lot of sense either. So really the script of Crimes of Grindelwald was just all over the place. It was a mess. And that's unfortunate because I thought Jude Law being introduced as a young Dumbledore was actually quite fantastic. And there are shining moments here. But whew, it's too long. It's too messy. And ultimately it just comes across as kind of a jumbled mess. Coming in at number 10, I have Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore. Despite being quite disappointed by Crimes of Grindelwald, I was actually pretty excited for The Secrets of Dumbledore because I was really, really wanting to get the long-awaited Dumbledore gay romance. We've been hearing about it for so long at this point. It's really been touted up. And we kind of get it. They certainly directly address it. But, oh, uh, it left me wanting a prequel to the prequels, to be honest. I want a film about young Dumbledore and young Grindelwald 
growing up their romance together and how that romance turns into mortal enemies. I think that actually would have been the more interesting prequel to tell. And this film just kind of proved it for me. I know some people are upset with the recasting of Grindelwald, but I thought Mads Mikkelsen was actually really good in the role. I liked his toned down design compared to the Johnny Depp design of the second film. And I thought he and Jude Law actually had some nice chemistry. Jude Law is once again fantastic here. The big problem with this film is that, once again, the script doesn't really know what to do. It's two main films kind of merged into one. Suddenly, main characters are being completely omitted from the film. These new characters that were supposed to really establish with the Fantastic Beasts films are sidelined here, including Newt Scamander, who has been our lead throughout these first few films. He's pretty much a side character here. But it also never fully commits to the Dumbledore and Grindelwald storyline. And then we get the true nature of Grindelwald's plan. And it's kind of just the same thing that we got with Voldemort. And that's a little bit disappointing. I don't know, to kind of just do the same game plan all over again. However, those little deers, I'm sorry I'm blanking. Oh my gosh. They were so freaking cute. I loved them so much. I was happy that this film at least made one of the Fantastic Beasts a central and key element to the film because Crimes of Grindelwald really didn't bring the Fantastic Beasts in in any sort of significant way. So I was at least happy that one of them played a key role in the story here. But it was too long. There were stretches of this film that just really felt like a slog. And uh, uh, and while I don't think it's a horrible film, I was still, well, underwhelmed, to say the least. Coming in at number nine, I have Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Mm. So if you watched my reactions, you'll note that I really wasn't a huge fan of this film as I watched it. Once again, I thought there were some really fun elements. Obviously, this entire tournament of the different wizarding schools was great. Getting Robert Pattinson in here was a lot of fun. And I actually really liked Cedric as a character. I loved the ending when Voldemort kind of materializes and unfortunately kills Cedric. Uh, but it's such a powerful moment for Harry as a character. Fortunately, most of the rest of the film pretty heavily just kind of focuses on teen angst and teen drama. All the dating and he likes this and she likes that. These girls are running around trying to like drug Harry Potter and drug these boys. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot going on in a Goblet of Fire. And to be honest, I just wasn't really a fan of how angsty it was as a film. So out of the OG Harry Potter films, it's certainly my least favorite there. Coming in at number eight, I have Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Yeah, it's the teen drama films that didn't really do it for me in the Harry Potter series. I'm sorry. Now overall, the darker tone, for the most part, of this film is what lifts it up something like Goblet of Fire. Because even though we have those fun sequences, we have that dragon moment in Goblet of Fire, the Half-Blood Prince has a lot of really heavy and important plots and thematic material here. Obviously, Dumbledore dying at the end of this film is a huge moment for the entire series. And honestly, the entire journey of Dumbledore and Harry Potter throughout this film is pretty fantastic. Fortunately, it's intercut with really, really kind of like light-toned, teeny drama left and right that undercuts so many of the emotional moments of the story. Most of them just don't work for me. We really start to develop these two relationships that ultimately end up being the marriages of the series but they feel unearned here they don't feel fully developed Ginny 
is meant to feel like more of a character, I think, than she actually is. And it resulted in me feeling pretty hollow toward most of the emotional beats outside of Dumbledore himself. On one hand, it's possibly one of the darkest of the Harry Potter films. But on the other hand, it's also one of the most ridiculous and dramatic. And when you merge those two together, it came up as one of the most uneven of the entire Harry Potter saga. Again, at number seven, I have Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. More or less really enjoyed this film. I think it is a cute movie that kind of rehashes a lot of the same beats the first film goes through. I'd say it's pretty similar in tone, though I don't know that it gets us all that much further when it comes to the plot. Of course, we get the revelation of Tom Riddle as young Voldemort, and we get the showdown with the Basilisk. That's our main driving plot point and the main contribution the film has overall. But I'd say maybe it feels like one of the more filler films in the franchise. It's cute, it's enjoyable, it's a lot of fun, but but overall, it doesn't have as much going on as the rest of the films above it here on the list. Again, at number six, I have Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Or the Philosopher's Stone, depending on where you hail from. <laughs> the very first, the film that kicked off an entire franchise that took the world by storm. Me, this is Ron's best film in the entire franchise. I think he's absolutely adorable here, though this is the first time he does his trend of making Hermione cry. <laughs> but it's a great introduction to this insane world, this magical world. A great introduction to our main core characters, who they are at their core, what they stand for, and who they will be moving throughout the series. I love our three-headed dog. <laughs> really enjoy Dumbledore and Minerva here in this film. And of course, the introduction to Hagrid and the delightful and somewhat underused Hedwig. It's a perfectly quaint magical journey to kick off a mega franchise. So now, kicking us off in the top five at that number five spot. I have Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part one. I'm going to be honest, heading into this film, I was actually quite worried that it was more or less going to be a whole lot of filler. And in some ways, I do think it's a lot of filler. It's a lot of traveling. It's a lot of, you know, Hobbit, Lord of the Rings style <laughs> storytelling, where our protagonists are literally just kind of moving from one place to another. However, unlike something like the previous film with the Half-Blood Prince, Deathly Hollows Part 1 is very consistent tonally. It sets up it exactly what we need it to set up and it leads to some of the most emotional moments for me in the entire series including Hedwig's death and then ultimately Dobby's death at the end of the film and honestly that moment with Dobby as we lead up to his final moment is some of the best character work I think on any character it's laid in that second film kind of a little bit precocious, a little bit obnoxious Dobby early on, but him coming full circle as a free elf to sacrifice himself, basically, is a really touching moment. Once we get more Bellatrix Lestrange, who I always love, and I think we really get the root of why I love Hermione, even in the later films, and what kind of friend she is to Harry, specifically. And it gives us a little bit more redeeming looks at Ron by the end of it all. What can I say? I like a film that doesn't have a whole lot going on in general. So that wasn't going to deter me when it comes to part one of Deathly Hollows. Coming in at number four, I have Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows part two. <gasps> I know this is probably going to be a controversial opinion, having the final film all the way down at number four. Now, there's so much I love 
in this film. So much that it does very well. Obviously, Voldemort is at his most intimidating. We get McGonagall and Molly getting in the action. And of course, I lived for the Molly Weasley, the Bellatrix showdown. We get this wonderful moment with Harry Potter and Dumbledore after the entire film really plants huge seeds of doubt on Dumbledore and who he was as a character and as a person and his kind of moral ambiguity to get to his end result. But ultimately, I really enjoyed his relationship and I'm glad we got one more scene at least with him in this final film. And then we get the Snape revelation, which is a pretty fantastic moment of Snape and what he had been doing this entire time and what his actual mission was. While I don't think it fully redeemed him, at least for me personally, I still think a lot of his behavior throughout the films was not appropriate as an adult and as a teacher with how he handled children. Uh, <laughs> and... Some of his resentment towards Harry was a lot of jealousy towards a small child growing up. Snape, you're petty, but we lived for the dramatic pettiness. Then we get small moments like Neville getting to prove his worth and showing what a great Gryffindor he is and Harry fulfilling his destiny. There's so much to love about this film. However, maybe it's just because I didn't have the near decade of buildup leading to it, but I will say, I think the end end of Deathly Hollows part two wraps up a little bit quickly and a little bit too neatly. Then we get like this little appendix section at the end with our heroes married and sending their kids off to Hogwarts and all that. I think a lot of the reason it's at number four for me instead of in the top three is simply where I was when I watched it. I didn't have that decades worth of buildup maybe not as much sentimentality towards the story and the characters in the film itself that hit me in the gut when it comes to emotion. So I think it's a really well-made film, a beautiful film, just not quite my favorite. Again, at number three, I have Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. <gasps> I know. I know. <laughs> Putting this above Deathly Hallows Part 2 is probably treason and treachery. I know there are tomatoes being flung my way as we speak. I'm sorry. I really, really enjoy Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And this film plucked all of my little animal-loving strings. Okay, I absolutely adore that little Niffler. Do you hear me? He is the MVP of the entire Fantastic Beasts franchise. <laughs> but I loved all of the beasts. I love that this film really focuses on what the title says. Yes, we have the whole thing with Credence going down, which is a really interesting setup to a film. But our main focus is Newt Scamander trying to find these Fantastic Beasts for his book, to put them into his sanctuary briefcase. I personally adore Newt Scamander as a protagonist. See y'all, Hufflepuffs unite. What can I say? <laughs> He's like the perfect beacon of anti-toxic masculinity. He is so adorable and Eddie Redmayne is so adorable in the role. Absolutely adore Queenie in this film before they took her down an unnecessary path that I did not enjoy in the next two films. He's amazing in this and honestly was quite in Newt for my favorite character of the entire film. Then we have everything with the like foster care system and the abuse storyline that I also found worked really well. It was great character development for Credence and established him early on as the character he was. Colin Farrell is amazing in this film. And I know, once again, this is not going to be popular amongst Johnny Depp fans. I think they should have just kept Colin Farrell as Grindelwald the entire series. Just have him be our antagonist the entire series. He was so good in this film. Honestly, everyone was so good. The effects were wonderful. The story was a delight in honesty. And it did set up what was to come specifically with Grindelwald himself, but it felt a lot more 
self-contained, then its sequels would lead on. And I miss these characters that they set up and this story that they set up because I enjoyed it so much. I really do love Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Spoiler alert, it was almost my number two on this list. I really struggled between which one to put two and which one to put number three. But, but we settled on Fantastic Beasts at number three for now. For now. <laughs> now, coming in at number two, my second favorite of the Wizarding World films is Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Of course, when you have a prestige director in the chair like Alfonso Cuaron, you know it's going to be a beautiful film. And Prisoner of Azkaban is a stunning film. Shot just impeccably, as you would anticipate from such a director. Now, the color palette is a little bit drab, but that kind of fits the tone of the film. I think as Azkaban is the first one that really kind of tips us into the darker tones for these Harry Potter films. I loved the mystery of this film. I love the overall intent and mission that our main characters are going on. We are... We have this great buildup of Sirius Black as a character, this villainous man on the run, on the loose. And he ultimately turns out to be a good guy, somebody on our side and somebody who cares for Harry Potter. We also have the reveal of that damn rat, (laughs) both figuratively and literally here in this film. Also introduced to Professor Lupin, who is a fantastic character, one of the best professors probably in the entire series that goes on to continue being one of Harry's greatest allies. We get Breakbeak, this amazing creature, and Hagrid's journey with him. Oh, it's so good. And of course, we get Hermione punching Draco Malfoy right in the damn nose, which always good in my book. It's a really well-executed story that just works as both this kind of mystery, this time travel, as well as one that really sheds a lot of light on the overall situation. It brings that darkness to the forefront that the first two films had been missing. That means my number one, my personal favorite film from the Wizarding World franchise is Harry Potter and the Order of the phoenix i don't know y'all i loved it as i was watching this film it really just took me to a different place than any of the other harry potter films i thought it was really fantastic once again the acting here is spot on it's so good everyone in this movie really delivers dolores umbridge as our main antagonist of the entire film is actually so good because she's so infuriating but such a good villain and i loved her presence as this villain in the film itself this idea of dumbledore kind of pulling back from harry it's kind of the major film where we start to feel that conflict within him that would really start to surface as we move forward in the story is fantastic of course being introduced to the order of the phoenix themselves is wonderful Opening the film up with these Dementors coming into the real world sets the tone so perfectly here as well. And it ends with one of my favorite scenes of the entire film when they are there in the council and it comes to this big showdown, obviously, between the Legion that is still committed to Voldemort versus these kids who are basically on the run for their lives. (laughs) And it all comes to head with the big battle. Voldemort versus Dumbledore in an actual wand fight. We have the Order of the Phoenix swooping in to save all of the kids. And of course, this is also the film, Bellatrix returns to kill Sirius Black. Like several others that were lower on the list, I think Order of the Phoenix truly balances out some more youthful type of character moments with our main cast with a lot of the dark moments and we have some real insurmountable odds to overcome tone just works it's so consistent but everything just works for me when it comes to order of the phoenix and that is why 
It is my personal favorite film from the Wizarding World franchise. That's it. That is my ranking of the 11 films from the Wizarding World franchise. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to go ahead and click that like button down below and subscribe to the channel so that you are always up to date on all of my latest videos. Also, join in on the discussion. Sound off. I know you're going to hate my ranking. It's okay. Most importantly, I want to hear how you rank these 11 films. Leave your own list in the comment section down below, or you can hit me up on Twitter. I love you all so much for your continued support. Mwah. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye.